Let's talk about Sandra Barkey's Foucault femininity and patriarchal domination and some of the ways in which social power serves to construct and enforce norms of femininity. Now, Sandra Barkey is drawing on the ideas of disciplinary power and the constructions of docile bodies that were originally developed by Michel Foucault. However, Foucault thought that these oh, systems of power affect everyone in more or less the same ways. Barkey disagrees. Instead, Barkey is noticing the ways in which power does different things. There are different sorts of norms and expectations on the basis of gender. So if somebody is slotted into the subject position, they're identified as being a woman, they're gonna be taught to act like a girl in all kinds of little and distinct ways. They're quite different from the ways that folks who are identified as boys early on are taught to behave as boys, right? Um, we'll talk about boys and constructions of masculinity next. Here we're gonna really look at the ways in which, oh, disciplinary power serves as an important mechanism for constructing and maintaining these expectations and these norms connected to femininity. Now, very first thing I want to note is that some of the examples Barkey uses are out of date. This text was written in, actually don't remember, I believe it is written in, let's see if I can find it, 1990. It's from a while ago. And the fact that some of her examples are out of date serves as a way to illustrate that our expectations of what it is to be a woman change through time. The things that one you're supposed to do, the things that you're expected to do to be a proper lady have changed. Often throughout history, they change, oh, depending on where you are geographically, what community you're in, right? So all of these norms and expectations uh, connected to femininity, they're not fixed. They're not sort of natural features of the world. They're things that exist in particular contexts at particular times, and we are taught to do them because that's what you're expected to do at the, in that context, at that time, in that kind of social setting, right? So these things, again, shift and change. So there are some examples that are out of date. However, it's deeply alarming how many of the examples still work. So Bert Key discusses a whole lot in this text. She looks at some of the expectations that are imposed upon girls and women. She writes that the disciplinary project of femininity is a setup, that it requires such radical and extensive measures of bodily transformation that every woman who gives herself to it is destined in some degree to fail. So Berkey here is looking at the ways in which disciplinary power sets up impossible expectations. And because we're exposed to those expectations over and over and over and over again, we start to internalize them. And we start to hold ourselves to those expectations. We start to conform to those kinds of social norms. But the expectations are impossible. So let's think about some of these norms that Barkey discusses in which we still see showing up in our daily lives all the time. So Barkey writes about, oh, some of the expectations connected to women's bodies and what shape those bodies are expected to be. When she was writing in the 90s, she discussed the tyranny of slenderness, right? So there was a particular body type that was held up as the ideal. These days it's shifted a little bit, right? So we're no longer just into the tyranny of sl slenderness. Now, uh, sort of the, I the ideal feminine body is one that has like thicker thighs, like a butt, hips, boobs, but still is extraordinarily slender and extraordinarily toned, right? It, ma it might have long lean muscles, but not big bulky muscles, right? So thinking about the ways in which girls and women are taught to either shape their bodies to conform to this ideal, this expectation, hello diet culture, or the ways in which we're taught to judge both our own bodies as well as others in accordance to these norms or expectations. Right? If you go to a gym, this has happened to me multiple times, where I have gone to a new gym, maybe I was working with a trainer, and they will explicitly tell me, oh, don't do the exercises that way, 
you'll build up big bulky muscles and surely you don't want to do that. Instead, they'll say, do it this other way so your muscles will be long and lean and it will look nice. Fuck no, I left those gems. Anyway, so, right, so this shows up from strangers. This shows up in not just how we're taught to think about, ah, what an ideal body would look like, but the actions and behaviors we're taught to build into our routines in order to achieve that body or look closer to that body, even if we're not really aware of it, right? So, um, even if, uh, what's an example, uh, for those long lean muscles that all those trainers thought that I would want, I do not, um, right? Uh, I believe running is one of the best ways to get that particular kind of muscle structure. And so like, if you're just taught, oh, running is an activity that, you know, girls and women often do, you might be doing some of those movements in order to achieve that idealized body without being aware that part of the reason you were originally introduced to those movements was because of the particular kinds of muscular or again, body shape or silhouette that they helped produce. So there are lots of actions that we start to take without necessarily intending them to be aimed at this particular purpose. All right, so some of the ways that women and girls are taught to shape and adorn their bodies have to do with, again, things like literally shaping that body in terms of weight or shape. It often has to do with adornment. So what hairstyle somebody has, whether somebody is, oh, introduced to makeup or jewelry at an early age, or if they have to sort of fight to get access to those things. Girls and women are often expected to be wearing makeup, to have at least some jewelry, right? To the point where many, many, many women have had the experience of not wearing makeup for a day and having people come up to them being like, oh, are you okay? You don't look well. Because the expectation of wearing makeup, of adorning one's body, literally painting and decorating one's body are so ingrained that now we think that the, view, uh, the appearance of one having makeup on is the normal or the natural one and not wearing makeup looks strange or weird or concerning. Right. Let's see what else here. Thinking about what clothes one is, again, just encouraged to wear by default. You could fairly easily uh, get access to clothing that is labeled or identified as being for a gender other than one's own. But many people are trained up from a super early age. You go to either a store in person or you go to the website and you click on the department or you walk to the department that has clothing for the gender that you've been raised as, right? Like this is one of the ways that we start to, again, take on these kinds of norms and expectations. It's by just gravitating towards the stuff that we've been exposed to over and over and over and over again. <sighs> And as Bart Key says, it's a setup. There is no way to actually live up to all of the expectations of idealized femininity. And this is where we especially see things like race and class starting to come into play. A lot of our beauty norms are built up out of whiteness, are built on histories of colonization and exploitation and imperialism, such that being white is held up as an ideal, right? So we see this deeply intensely, especially with things like colorism or expectations connected to hair, hair texture, what professional looking hair looks like. It's always white hair. It's always Eurocentric hair. And that gets held up as some kind of natural ideal that everyone is not only expected to aspire to, but to be able to have or to access. And that's obviously not the case. So already these norms of idealized femininity are building in a kind of incredibly white-centric, Eurocentric, and incredibly classed hierarchy in which folks who have access to wealth, who have access to social status on the basis of race, who have access to social status on the basis of body size or body shape, and especially those who have access to wealth, who are able to more robustly utilize resources to shape or modify their bodies or appearances are better positioned to be able to achieve those ideals of idealized femininity. And somebody isn't getting close to these ideals of femininity, there's often pretty strong social sanctions. People might side-eye them. They might not get that job. They might be 
I don't know, left out of friend groups. They might be the butt of jokes. They might be bullied, might get, again, increasingly bad. So there's a lot of pressure to conform, but a lot of people, a lot of the work of conforming is work that we start to, again, impose on ourselves. Uh, so if we don't conform, we'll face punishment. But then at the same time, if you're seen as working to conform, you might also face punishment. So think about all of the criticisms that women face for wearing makeup, for attending to appearance, for being shallow, for being trivial, for being vain. Think about how often women are mocked and ridiculed for doing all of the things that they were taught to do. And not just taught to do, but taught that if you don't do this, you'll be mocked and ridiculed, right? So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Same thing holds when we start to think about norms of sexuality for girls and women. As Bartke writes about, women and teenage girls are expected to be sexually attractive, are expected to be sexually available, but not too available, right? So they're expected to, you know, be sort of this perfect sexual object, to be something that men and boys will desire, will, you know, have a great time with when they hook up, but they're not supposed to have that much experience, right? They're not supposed to actually desire sex or that else they risk being labeled as a slut or a whore. Um, and if that happens, again, there are grave social consequences. Anyone who's been through high school is likely to know some of those consequences. Um, so there are these impossible expectations, these expectations of both being sexually active, but not being sexually active, of oh, having sexual experience, but never actually desiring sex. And crucially, women's sexual agency is constructed in terms of being appealing or desi desirable to men and teenage boys. The expectation is that women and girls are expected to do this in order to appeal to men rather than because they have the sexual desires of their own. So look at the ways that heteronormativity, the expectation that everybody is straight, is already built in to the structure of femininity. It's not that we start off with these norms of idealized femininity and then say, oh yes, and heteronormativity, and we assume that everyone's straight. Rather, that expectation is part of the construction of femininity itself. <sighs> Once again, we are taught to just do a lot of these things. We're ex but, eh, exposed to these expectations over and over and over again from a ridiculously early age. One of my intense pet peeves are um, the ways in which we hypersexualize very, very, very young children, such that we have, oh, like onesies for infants that say things like little heartbreaker. No, <laughs> the infant should not be viewed as sexually or romantically either desirable, A, but especially not sexually and romantically like agential as having agency to break hearts in that context that is creepy and gross. Okay. So this happens from a ridiculously young age and it happens over and over and over again. It's not just that it's, you know, one onesie, but that these are little comments from friends, from family, from servers at restaurants. These are, we see this if there are, you know, like a two two-year-olds playing next to each other. Um, and one of them has been labeled as a boy, another has been labeled as a girl. And the parents or the adults around might say, oh, they're boyfriend and girlfriend. They're two-year-olds. They're really not at the stage of establishing a uh, sexual or romantic relationship with one another. They're deeply not boyfriend and girlfriend. But we do this. We impose these expectations on kids from, again, a ridiculously early age. And by hearing those comments over and over and over, kids start to learn, oh, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. Right. Let's see what else here. Thinking about what clothes one is, again, just encouraged to wear by default. You could fairly easily uh, get access to clothing that is labeled or identified as being for a gender other than one's own. But many people are trained up from a super early age. You 
go to either a store in person or you go to the website and you click on the department or you walk to the department that has clothing for the gender that you've been raised as, right? Like this is one of the ways that we start to, again, take on these kinds of norms and expectations. It's by just gravitating towards the stuff that we've been exposed to over and over and over and over again. <sighs> Anyone who has spent any amount of time scrolling through social media is likely very familiar with the ways in which there are a lot of expectations that we start to see. We see oh, other people looking perfect. We see people looking like they're having, I don't know, fucking amazing lives. <laughs> they are showing us the funniest, the best, the most entertaining, the most ridiculous moments. And then we say, shit, I don't know if my life looks like that. I don't know if I look like that. And we start to feel bad about ourselves. And we might start to shape and conform our own behavior to make it at least look like the things that we're seeing on social media. This is a modern day disciplinary practice. The ways in which we're exposed to these expectations, we see them over and over and over. Repetition is really important. And we start to internalize them. Even if you know that most of the things you see on social media are fake, we still feel like we should live up to it, right? That's part of what's so insidious about social media. Even if you disagree with it, or like, I know I don't want to live my life like that, or I know that that's not a good way to like live my life. We often still feel the pull of it or still feel the expectation. Sometimes we'll think, oh God, if other people like really saw what I was doing right now, that would be, I would be embarrassed, right? Thinking again about social media and what it takes to live that perfect life. Think about all of the money that went into buying clothes, buying makeup, maybe buying editing software, um, having like a phone or computer with good camera, good lighting, all of this crap. Um, thinking about the time it takes to do all of that social media editing to, again, be able to access the markers um, that signal uh, something like wealth, um, but also just like social status or social capital, right? You need to have, again, like some kind of privilege um, in order to easily access these things. It's much harder if you don't have privilege. Once again, going back to that idea of disciplinary power being something that we enforce on ourselves out of the concern that maybe at some point, perhaps we, we might be observed. Somebody might see us and expect us to be conforming in one way or another. So social media is a powerful disciplinary practice, and it is distributing and enforcing all kinds of social norms connected to femininity. We start to internalize these norms, and it starts to seem normal and natural. And the process by which we're taught to conform becomes pretty invisible. You don't notice it unless you're actively trying to not conform. Um, unless you're like, no, these norms don't work for me. I need to do something else. And this is pervasive in our daily lives. We see this on social media. We see this in the ways that children are raised. We also see this in the ways that we interact with our friends. We see this in the little moments. Um, maybe when we're by ourselves and you're like, what shall I do to relax? I don't know, like try a new hairstyle or I'll watch a makeup tutorial and try out a new technique, um, right? And I do wanna be clear here. These are all examples of how disciplinary power is at work. These are all instances of the ways in which we are taught to produce docile bodies so that they can be in accordance with these norms of femininity. There are repercussions for not conforming, but that doesn't mean that the different practices that we're engaging in are necessarily wrong or bad, right? Makeup is neither good nor bad in and of itself. Wearing big poofy fluffy dresses is not a bad thing. Loving bright pink is delightful, right? All of these things connected to idealized femininity, they're often labeled as trivial or bad or vain or frivolous or just like, you know, subpar. Let's push back against that assumption too, right? There can be great, wonderful reasons to play with makeup. It is fun. Twirling around in a floofy skirt is delightful, as is 
running around in sneakers, preferably ones that have lights on the bottom, right? There are many delightful things that one can do with one's body. There are many delightful things one can do with one's appearance. And we don't want to set up a system where we identify the ways in which disciplinary power is at work and then label everything that's been coded as feminine as somehow bad or something to stay away from. Instead, we just want to notice the ways in which these systems of power are functioning, how it is playing out in our daily lives, and to recognize that we could organize things differently. And in fact, in 100 years, we will organize things differently. The question is just how will we be organizing them? <laughs>